Yeah, um, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, as was already presented right now, I'm a psychologist and uh, will present my current PhD project, which I'm doing in Hannover at Eckhard Altmüller's lab. And uh, a slight warning, I think I will not say the words hearing or listening in my presentation at all. So <laughs> just see this as a little excursion into something else today, because I'm not talking about hearing loss, I'm talking about the loss of movement control. Um, which is called musician's dystonia. And some of you might be familiar with this concept, um, also known as focal dystonia in other areas or professions. Um, but I still want to say um, a bit more about the disorder. Um, this musician's dystonia is characterized by loss of uh, voluntary, vol vol voluntary movement control. Um, which means basically that as soon as a musician gets to the instrument, the muscles cramp up. We can, for example, imagine a pianist um, who is getting close to the piano and wants to start playing, and then his fingers curl in, like you see in these pictures, and um, he's not able to control them voluntarily, which is not painful to him, but of course highly stressful because he's not able to uh, do his job. Um, mostly musicians' dystonia occurs in um, instruments which requ require high of um, temporal and spatial precision. So the piano, of course, but also the violin and the flute and the guitar are often affected. Um, and it can also happen in the muscles of the lips and the tongue, so in the embouchure, for brass players. Um, there are a few things that we already know about the origins of musicians' dystonia, but it's still not very clear how, um, how the etiology of this disorder works, because um, this task specificity is just very intriguing. I mean, our pianist is able to do all other fine motor things, like exam for example, button his shirt or tie his shoe, but as soon as he wants to play, he's not able to do it. Um, and this leads us to think that it's not only a neurological disorder, but also um, that there's a strong psychological component involved in all of this. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> as for the facts that we, or the factors that we already know about, there are some things, for example, um, like sex, that males are more often affected than females. There also seems to be um, a genetic component, so it's hereditary. Um, and some of you might also have already heard about um, the neurological side of this disorder. Um, often in this context, uh, dysfunctional plasticity is mentioned, which means that our brain adapts because we do music, um, but not always in the best possible way. So sometimes these um, adaptations are dysfunctional, and um, especially in this, and for musicians' dystonia, um, plasticity has been monitored in the sensory motor areas um, on the cortex and also in the basal ganglia, which are uh, responsible for uh, voluntary movement control and voluntary movement planning and also alterations in the cerebellum, which is uh, responsible for fine motor control. So these have been found in some studies. Um, then we have also looked at, or other studies have also looked at the um, psychological side and um, looked at personality dispositions. They found that dystonia patients are often um, more perfectionist than healthy musicians, and they also tend to experience a lot of anxiety, which might even go to a psychopathological state. So um, on the psychological side, these, definitely, um, these two definitely play a big role. And lastly for this, um, many uh, patients have reported that the outbreak of the dystonia was during a very stressful phase in their life. So this might be a trial year in an orchestra or just the preparation phase for a very important concert or audition um, or also just personal stress, this seems to be one of the triggers for dystonia. Um, what we want to do now in my project is to go one step further back because it's um, of interest to us how, um, yeah, what comes before this. Um, because my professor who, oh, wrong direction. Um, who has dedicated the last decades 
uh, to finding out what causes musicians dystonia, um, has often observed that people um, talk about adverse childhood experiences and that they report that they have some traumatic event in their childhood or in their youth. So adverse childhood experiences, this can be like more the, the classical trauma that we think about, which is, um, of course, physical or sexual abuse, emotional neglect. But um, in this context, it can also be very um, low key, I would say. Um, so negative experiences with the parents or um, a negative child parent relationship, um, or even of course in the instrumental con context, um, a difficult relationship with the early instrumental teachers. Um, and of course, as always in psychology, we think that all of this is interrelated um, and we want to try to figure out how it is interrelated. Um, my study is divided into two parts. The first part lo is more, um, yeah, looks more on the psychological um, side. This is um, part of my master thesis already, which um, was published uh, this spring. And for this, we asked a rather large group of, um, of musicians about their childhood events. We used the childhood trauma questionnaire and also the adverse childhood experiences experiences questionnaire um, and we found that indeed um, there seem to be tendencies that um, our dystonia patients have experienced more um, more emotional neglect uh, in particular in particular but also seem to have experienced all sorts of adverse events more often than our healthy musicians um, it is important to say that our groups differed quite a lot in age and uh, yeah in sex distribution so it's quite difficult to compare them this is why we took this questionnaire again to the part two part of my study which i'll come to in a second um but yeah the tendencies were quite clear and we could even um see that emotional neglect might be a possible predictor for musicians dystonia um so we decided to take this to the next level and to see if really there are traumatic experiences in the childhood of our patients, how do they influence our, um, yeah, our psychology or our psychological dispositions and also our neurological functioning in a way that we then might develop dystonia. Um, there are some, some studies already about this I mean, we know that childhood trauma affects our body in very different ways. It leads to higher anxiety and perfectionism scores, which are also related to dystonia. Um, and it also leads to alterations in the HPA axis functioning. So it um, alters how we perceive stress and how we react to stress. And this in particular is important for my project right now because um, different stress reactivity would on the one hand, uh, influence how our uh, yeah, motor networks and limbic networks interact to maybe make us more vulnerable to dystonia. And stress also leads to higher muscular tension, which is also, of course, to, connected to muscular cramps um, and might be a trigger for movement learning. Oh. Um, so therefore, we constructed an hypothesis for this whole question together, which is uh, negative childhood experiences are a risk factor for musicians dystonia via their effect on individual stress reactivity, psychopathology and personality dispositions. We are doing this by comparing dystonia patients and healthy controls, which are also professional musicians. Um, all of them are affected by dystonia in the hand or the fingers, so no embouchure dystonia. Um, and we try this time, because that was not this like this in the part one study, we try to really match them by instrument sex and age so that we have a pair for, yeah, a match for every dystonia patient. And then we're doing some psychological assessments. There are quite a lot of questionnaires. Of course, we ask them about their childhood experiences, but um, there are also questionnaires about resilience, um, anxiety, depression, um, and some personality dispositions. And then we also um, 
put them in the fMRI scanner, where we want to see, um, I mean, we're also looking at resting state and structural imaging, but that's not so important for today. Um, we mainly want to see how they react to stress when we put them in the scanner and if that differs between patients and controls. Um, for that, we look at the um, blood oxygenation level dependent activity in a stress paradigm and we also take um, yeah, saliva samples to measure cortisol throughout this um, uh, yeah, experiment. Uh, here you can see the study design as we're conducting it right now. So we have uh, first the arrival time where we take the first saliva sample, then we do structural, stru structural and resting state imaging, and then, yeah, we stress them. <laughs> and, I mean, if you can think of an easy way to stress people, we let them do math. Um, so they go into the scanner and they see a screen which is like this, um, this is the control condition. I think most of us will be able to solve this one. Um, they see the screen and they have a rotary dial where they can pick the right answer. Um, and then there are different conditions. This is the control condition with the uh, yellow line around. And then they also have the experimental condition, which is a bit more tricky. Um, here we have additionally the bar on the top, which um, shows you the average and then how you perform in relation to the average. Um, and then we also have the blue one is the time bar, which goes ridiculously quickly. Um, and it, it really stresses people out. <laughs> um, when they've done this for the first time after the missed number one, I go inside and I tell them, I'm sorry, this was just not good enough. We need you to concentrate more because um, we cannot use your data like this. <laughs> and I tell them everybody else was able to do it and you're not, I really don't know what to do. We have to try again. Um, this is actually very hard for me, <laughs> but um, it works. And yeah, then they do the same thing again. And afterwards I debrief them very quickly and I tell them everything was fine. You didn't perform worse than everybody else. And most of them forgive me afterwards. <laughs> um, yeah, throughout the whole thing, we collect saliva samples to see if the cortisol levels differ in any way. Um, for the methods um, that we will use afterwards, just to look at the stress data, um, as I said, we are looking at bold activities. So we want to see which regions are more active in the um, stress condition than in the control condition. For this, we subtract the, um, the activity of the control condition from the stress condition. Um, and then we do uh, yeah, independent t-tests to compare how the groups differ in their stress reaction. Um, in the next step, we will then also um, yeah, relate this brain activation to our psychological data, so to the childhood trauma and also um, to the dystonia, yes, no. Um, this is all to come, and um, this is the plan. <laughs> um, and these are the areas we expect to be more active during the MIST, um, the Montreal Imaging Stress Test. Um, of course, we have some uh, visual activation and some sensory motor activation because they're looking at the task and they're doing the, the yeah, they're moving their fingers to, to look in the answers. Um, but we also expect, um, or previous studies have also shown higher activation in the thalamus and the syn syndrolate gyrus. And we also look, of course, at stress-related brain areas. So the whole limbic system and the amygdala and hippocampus and the, yeah, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, so there's a lot. Uh, about the current status, um, I cannot show you too much of the data today because we're in the middle of data collection phase. Um, like this, we have now 19 patients and uh, 11 controls. And those of you who are familiar with the YouTube channel MyLab, which is a German channel, um, and are familiar with the five phases of a PhD project, we are now in the data zombie phase. <laughs> so I'm mostly uh, yeah, recruiting and organizing patients and participants all the time. Um, but still, I want to give you a very small outlook about uh, yeah, what we see this far this is this is just purely descriptive what is falling now um we 
analyzed some of the cortisol data already. And this was actually, this is the um, cortisol data of our very first patient who came in, uh, um, pianist with dystonia, 34 years old. And I was so happy when I saw this because this is exactly textbook how we wanted it to be. Um, so he comes in and he's quite relaxed. And then at you see here, at, um, after um, the start of the uh, stress task, after S3, his cortisol levels rise. And then after S5, uh, when he gets the debriefing and he is told everything is okay, he performed well, the cortisol levels go down again. Um, so this was great, but uh, yeah, spoiler, he was the only one so far. <laughs> all the other cortisol data are all over the place. <laughs> But we will see, there aren't that many we analyzed yet. Um, as for the brain data, and um, this is also from the same participant, um, we found some increased activation in the premotor cortex and the supplemental motor area, which all makes perfect sense um, and is to be expected. Um, the activation wasn't that clear in the stress versus control um, condition, but this might be because he was already so stressed out in the control condition by the math task um, that, which you can see here, this is the combined stress and control activation compared to the rest, um, rest condition. So you see there are a lot more of activations as we expect them to be in this, uh, yeah, with this analysis. But there we are still, and um, this is just uh, yeah, first level, so single subject analysis, and we still need to analyze the, the group level analysis. Um, and also a very short outlook on um, to, the, um, to the questionnaires we have this time. This is also, again, these are the answers for the childhood trauma questionnaire, also here purely descriptive. Um, and you can just see from the 30 participants that we have now that there are again slight tendencies that our MD group, so the musicians dystonia group, has experienced more physical, emotional neglect and other forms of abuse. And you can also see this um, in the total, uh, total score of the childhood trauma questionnaire that there's just um, a bigger range of the total scores. But um, I mean, I haven't done the analysis yet, but I'm pretty sure that it might not be significant. But still, um, we have only measured about half of our patients now and um, we will see how it turns out. Um, yeah, to conclude, this talk and to give you a small outlook of what's to come. So as I just said, data zombie phase, I'm collecting data and afterwards I'll do the analyses. Um, we expect that there are indeed higher frequencies of negative childhood experiences in our dystonia patients and that also the dystonia patients show an increased stress response um, after, yeah, um, in the Montreal Imaging Stress Task. Um, so to give you like a small take home message, we can, I think, say that emotional neglect is a risk factor for the development of musicians dystonia and that, that this psychological side should definitely be considered when you treat musicians dystonia and also when you try to prevent it. It just needs more awareness um, for especially music uh, teachers and parents to help their students into a healthy practice um, rhythm and also yeah to to aid them psychologically if they should need it um, this is all i have so far i thank you very much for your attention and i'm open to questions now if you have any